Yeah, um, content workflow, a production process. Our panel will really be sharing some ideas on exactly how you can harness AI. So let's introduce them. Um, on my, uh, as you're looking right, is Joe Ellis, who is the CEO of Vidrover. Joe is based in New York, and Vidrover's a, a search, he'll tell us more about this, of course, but a search and understanding company that works with lots of different broadcasters and providers like Associated Press, using machine learning to look across video and make sense of, of massive amounts of live and archive video. So potentially really interesting use cases there. Um, next along is uh, Jacob uh, Humus, who is the vice president at a company called Wild Mocha, if I pronounce that right. Uh, <laughs> Jacob's from Germany. The company is based in the south of France near Nice. And the product is an AI-enabled platform that automates the process of clipping highlights. Uh, again, sport could be one of the uh, areas that are relevant there. If you have a long match and you want to put highlights out onto social media platforms or, or digital platforms, then the Wild Mocker product can help with that. Uh, Jacob will tell us more. And then Neil Stevens, uh, who is the video product manager for Adobe, based here in the UK. Uh, I'm sure Adobe needs no introduction at all to anyone here. Um, but Adobe's been pioneering the, the practical use of AI-enabled tools and embedding them throughout its uh, product suite um, with its Sensei technology. So we will hear more about that. So the format for this session is, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to give a bit of an introduction to what they do, why they think AI is so important to content production workflows and how they've developed something that can actually work for creative people. And then we'll get into a bit of a discussion and of course we'll also be opening up to your questions so think of things to ask and in the sort of towards the last uh, 10 minutes I'll be asking for your input. So cool. uh, Joe, tell us a little bit more about Vidrover and, and why Lovely. you are changing the face of video. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate you guys and I'm happy to be on the panel with you. It's actually really interesting. So the title is Where It's Worked in Film and TV. I've been working in video search and broadly computer vision and machine learning for video for since 2012. I can tell you back then it did not work. Nothing was working and you couldn't get any useful stuff out of the platforms that we were building. Uh, so continued to build the solution while I was doing my PhD at Columbia University from 2012 all the way up to 2016. And once we had built, spent kind of four years developing this product that went through and takes large pieces of format video. We were at the time recording hundreds of hours of television content a day um, and then providing detailed information on every section of that video. So we'd be able to answer detailed queries like, show me Christy Namanpour talking about the latest Brexit referendum or something like that and actually jump right to that section of video. Uh, we then built an interface that we just made available and it was behind a password and all this different stuff. Um, and people would just search and kind of look through the, the, the television and be able to find all the different pieces of content about this. When we started showing it to media companies when it was starting to work broadly in 2016, there was two real points of feedback that they said. One was, hey, this is really interesting. We have these large archives that we currently don't make available either to our editors or our users. Uh, this type of service would be able to quickly digitize those assets and make them available. Second thing they would always tell us was, we have a really hard editorial workflow transitioning linear content, which there's an entire team working around, um, and then publishing that digitally as well. And so you're solving these two things, that's great. And then the third thing they would always tell me is, currently you're stealing all of our stuff. You're just taking television, storing it on your own service, ripping it up, and then providing it in a search interface. We would sue the heck out of you if you started this business, so don't do it that way. Um, and so I said, okay, sounds good. We started, and that, that's kind of how the onus of VidRover came. We started building a cloud computing infrastructure that we could actually take to media companies to help them transition both linear uh, live stream assets and television content as well. So today what we do is uh, we work with companies, they send us their television, we then provide this detailed metadata and give them start points, end points, that we think would make great digital clips or digital shorts. We'll then uh, automatically add the detailed metadata around that, whether it's hashtags from social media that are related to the content, people that are talking or topics being covered. Those then go into a CMS that the editors themselves can then make a decision around, hey, was this cut too short? Was this cut too long? Change that and then publish that content out. 
the other solution that we provide folks is a search interface. So we actually have an interface that we can go over um, and can embed directly into an editorial workflow. So say if you're typing an article, um, we'll find the sections of that article that might be most relevant to a piece of video within that larger format archive um, and be able to surface that without potentially uh, something that the editor would have known about per se, uh, and then present that from a result, and then that can be published out. Our long-term goal and kind of vision of what we want to build with our company is starting in 2016, the way that people consumed content online, there wasn't, and in particular video content, there wasn't a ton of user intent involved in that. It's oftentimes a video that's shown to you in a recommendation or something that just pops up on a website that you visit. We want to be able to actually have the user be really active in the experience of finding, searching, and answering, the, answering those informative search queries using video. So tell us about some of the people you're working with. We mentioned broadcasters and, and, and Associated Press as one of the huge uh, news agency video providers. Yeah. Um, so once you apply your technology to that and you can start detecting what's in the video, how does it actually turn into practical benefits for those organizations? It's a great question. So. For example, one of the broadcasters we're working with in the US, when they took an hour long piece of content, they would typically chop it up into say like eight segments that were reasonable and, 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 and then those would go out and they, they could publish those. Using VidRover's technology, we're able to generate something more like 40 to 45 of those clips. Then using those, editors can create really nice personalized or curated uh, video streams or pieces of video content. So you have this entire larger library of really detailed granular sections of content that can be then be used downstream in applications, OTT, whatever that might be. Great, now Jacko, turning to you, tell us a little bit about your platform because there's probably some similarities but also some differences. So what's your take on this? Yeah, sure, so uh, thank you for having me here today. Wildmarker is actually focused on live streams. So that's a probably the biggest yeah. difference. So we are focused on giving the editor the means to quickly turn around a live stream, cutting it into video, editing it with pre-roll, post-roll, and sending it to destinations. So the destination that can be the own website, that can be your mobile app, that might be um, all the social media networks like Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And now, why is artificial intelligence very important for us? It is in order to give editors the means to have that turnaround time as short as possible, and sometimes even an automatic turnaround where we just set up the rules in beforehand and then clips are generated automatically. Let me give you an example. Um, I don't know whether you know that he, them here be in sports um, as a, um, probably one of the biggest sports provider internationally. They use us in France in order to automatically create in-game highlights. Up to 150 highlights per game are pushed automatically to the mobile app um, and you see them in a kind of a timeline as you know from Twitter. So that allows you as a user, as, as a subscriber at be in to actually follow a live game without physically um, being 90 minutes focused on the game, meaning you can do that while working or while with the family and still go to the pub afterwards and speak <laughs> with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> and what are the challenges of doing that live? You, you can't sort of go back and crawl through that content close, slowly and analyze it frame by frame. So how are you sort of dealing with a live element? And does that mean you have certain compromises in how you can detect uh, shots versus something that's working in non-real time? I wouldn't say compromises. I mean, we do have some time. I mean, we are about 60 seconds um, after uh, uh, publishing the highlight, after the action, which might be a goal. Um, and what we typically do is we do not automate everything. We automate, let's say, goals, because goals always you want to push them. Then do you want to publish each tackle? You don't know. I mean, uh, so what we do is we uh, cut it and we propose it to the editor, and the editor says, yes, this is good enough. I want it published. Great. Now, uh, Adobe, obviously, most people here will have used your tools at one time or another for, for editing and post-production. Tell us a little bit about how you're embedding AI into that part of the, uh, the process. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. So, so indeed, yeah, Adobe's um, an established prominent brand, and it's been about seven years since we made the shift from uh, what we then called Creative Suite across to uh, Creative Cloud. 
And initially, that really was just a new mechanism to deliver desktop software to the users via the internet rather than a shiny disk. But during that time, we've fast begun to approach a tipping point where more and more of the value of our, what we offer is represented in the cloud-based services, um, the workflow, the time-saving devices, and one of which is AI. And that now has tendrils throughout our clouds, um, both the creative cloud and the experience cloud. Um, and we've termed that uh, Adobe Sensei. So that really is the, the catch-all brand that we give to our machine learning AI um, service. So examples of that are an early one was, for example, in Photoshop, we had the content aware fill tool that's been around a while now, but it allows you to delete a selection of an image and it will intelligently analyze pixels, pixels around that to um, look for, for content to fill the hole. So it's as if that foreground object uh, was not, never there. But um, that's kind of extended now into our stock platform. For those of you who've used the Adobe stock repository, um, it's a royalty-free royalty -free image um, bank of up to 100 million assets now. But what we have in there is a Sensei-based image search as well. So if, for example, you have an image or, uh, that you don't have rights to use, you can use that to prompt a search. So Sensei will then analyze the image and find you other things that look like it based on color, composition, object content, and all the rest of it. Uh, and indeed, you know, on the audio side as well now, our new Rush um, cross-platform editing tool has got auto-ducking, which again was driven by machine learning. We fed hours and hours of audio content into it so it could learn the concept of what was speech and what was noise, and then in turn be able to uh, lower the level of music um, against dialogue and things like that. So if we can have a quick look at a video, I can show you. Um, it's picture only. I'll talk, I'll talk to this. But this is um, some sneaks from our Max conference last year. So what you see there is a chap dancing along in front of a building. Using conventional rotoscoping techniques, you can see the mask breaks up very quickly. So adding AI Sensei to the mask detection, you see how it's instantly tracked the edge outline around that object by knowing more about what outlines of people look like? So the propagation of that mask is now infinitely quicker and more accurate, which allows us, for example, to insert a, a mid-object in between the background and foreground objects. That's Sensei-driven. Again, cropping this content for, uh, example, vertical video for social is tricky because the foreground object is, is not staying near the center, so it would go in and out of shot after being cropped. Uh, whereas, again, adding Sensei, it's able to determine what is an important foreground object, in this case, the car, and then give you a vertically cropped version that actually has the right pan and scan vectors in it to preserve that. Um, one of the last examples we've got here as well is what to do with a, a still image to, to make it a bit more vibrant. Uh, we, can, we can zoom into it, or we can actually, again, use Sensei technology to again, determine the concept of foreground and background objects and do some in-betweening in order so that that chair you see is beginning to obscure the lamp, even though it was only ever a two-dimensional image. Same with the foreground rock there. It's cutting out that and it's superimposing and panning in different axes and inter creating and interpolating the pixels in between to make that more interesting. This last example here again showing us that lady. So some examples there of Sensei at work. Um, and really it's been created, a theme is emerging already again in terms of like delivering content on time. That's, that's very much a factor here. We've termed that, in fact, content velocity. And we believe that's something that's quickly getting beyond human scale. So. Good. I'd like to do a quick show of hands. Who here is involved in editing post-production, working with video, making clips, a journalist perhaps? So quite a few of us. It sounds like you guys are trying to put them all out of a job. <laughs> Joe, tell us, tell us about how your technology is. it replacing people in that creative <laughs> process or is it helping them? No, no, not at all. Yeah, so everything that we do at VidRover is for helping people. Uh, run through their creative processes. And so what we almost always do whenever we go to a company is we sit down and we understand exactly what they're doing. Uh, I almost, we always talk to an editor or someone that's running through the post, either the post-production or pre-production process. Uh, and oftentimes we'll talk to them about what portions of your job do you like the least? Um, and those are the sections of, that, that we, we try to automate with that process. And whether that's automatically adding tags back into linear video once it's already applied and, and, and building better search from a solution like that, or you have these manual descriptions that are quite low level and not particularly complicated, can we help automate that process so then um, there's better things that you could be doing with, your, with your, your time from your editorial time? Because we want to take those really 
what are broadly remedial tasks um, that, that machines can do and allow creativity on top of that the, the humans are able to actually um, understand today that we're not really that close from a machine perspective, to be honest. Uh, and Niels, what's been the reaction from the creatives and editors you've worked with? Have they welcomed these new tools or do they see it as a sort of trying to automate things that are part of the core creative process? I, I think they're struggling, to be honest, in, in response to the explosion for uh, the amount of hours of required content yeah. delivery. You know, they're, they're drowning in many cases to meet some of those requirements in terms of multi-format, multi-language, multi-platform. So anything that can actually remove, as you say, the less interesting parts of their work, the repetitive tasks, Auto-tagging, you know, who wants to log anymore? Particularly in the field of reality television, we see automatic logging as replacing, you know, a, a human, human eyes and hands before long, simply because it is such a labor-intensive, repetitive task. So, so I think in order to meet the, the demands, I think the AI is becoming more and more interesting a requirement to, to meet that. Uh, and Jacob, your solution is maybe even going one step beyond the creative process into an editorial process. It's, it's effectively deciding on what is a, what is a highlight clip how can you be sure it's getting it right every time? And, and is it doing as good a job as the humans? Yes, it does. Um, the, I, I think the, the point here is how much is actually driven by artificial intelligence and how much do we actually also combine other data? So, I mean, obviously, if you're going for a football game um, from the first league somewhere, somebody paid millions for that you do not want to rely only on AI. You also have a data feed, you also have um, uh, stats, and you have editors on it. So basically, by combining all of that, what we do is we give people the chance to produce much more content much faster and publish it to, much, to many more destinations at the same time. Um, just uh, to give you an idea, I think the video content is increasing every year by quite, uh, I think it's about uh, twice or something like that. But uh, what really strikes me is, I mean, we have 10 platforms now where we need to publish to and um, to all of that. I mean, we have seen this example with the automatic cropping. You need to have a different format for Facebook uh, than uh, for Instagram, than uh, for uh, um, YouTube as example. And if that can be done automatically, yeah, you really want to have that. And Joe, what about your solution? If you're um, detecting images for the Associated Press and you, you recognize the wrong person is speaking, again, yeah. there's implications there. So how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? It's a great question. So one thing is the media company themselves really has to understand the level of inaccuracy that they're willing to handle. So for example, uh, miscategorizing someone as someone else is a major mistake. So maybe you shouldn't be showing those type of categorizations to a user without that going through an editorial process. Within VidRover, we have a metadata editing functionality where we'll present things, we have confidence scores. So typically the way that we'll do that is let the customer decide, okay, how confident do we really need to be for you to be able to push something straight to the user compared to uh, just presenting results that will go then to an editor to help uh, speed up their workflow processes. And I think like there's different ways that you can think about it, right? So we have a search solution, and one thing that we can do is we'll break out uh, the videos that are most related to the content, but then we'll have all these filters that you can use. There'll be the different people that are in the video, there'll be the visual content, there'll be the topics that are being covered. Now those can be completely automated and people can just see them and use them. Now, if you're comfortable with that, you have to be un uh, understanding there might be a couple of issues there. If you still wanna launch a completely automated solution with no editorial interface, you can do that but maybe just show the videos. Those are post-production assets. You know they're going to be clean. They might not be perfect for that search result, but the worst thing that you're potentially going to show a user is a video that you generated at some point in time that might not be the most relevant piece of content. That's okay. I want to take a moment out of the use cases just to get into some of the more geeky terminology that goes on around AI. And it's helpful that we have a, a PhD candidate uh, researcher with us who um, did a lot of academic research into that. The terms AI and machine learning, they typically get conflated, used together, I'm guilty of this. Um, I know it doesn't really matter what the difference is, but I think it is important when people are making claims about what certain things can do. So just give us a quick 10 second overview of what, what is AI and what is machine learning and, and where those two would be used in different situations. Uh, Joe, you go first and then, and then I'll ask you, Jacob. 
Cool. Yeah, the way that I think about it is machine learning are the algorithms that we use um, to actually deliver products or deliver solutions. AI is kind of the broader solution set that exists within those products and those features that machine learning is driving today. We're pretty far from like a broad or video AI, but video machine learning solutions are starting to filter into the market and working in particular areas. So we don't use AI or machine learning as terms. Um, but we speak about basically what we do with it, and that would be automation of um, creation of, of those um, highlight creation or automation of um, choosing the right uh, part of a, of a scene of if, if you crop automation in order to actually choose the right in and out points. Um, all of that, there is some machine learning behind it. There's um, um, uh, some... Uh, um, working on audio analysis, on video analysis, on picture analysis. But whether it is artificial intelligence, machine learning, or whatever, who cares, <laughs> correct? <laughs> totally. So the focus is on what can you do with it and what are the outcomes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we get to the stage when, I mean, at the moment, you can automate some of the drudge work, you can speed up the creative process and post-production process. We can perhaps start to learn what people like to watch and tailor content to them. Do we get to the stage in the future that AI tools can start to be creative, start to tell stories, start to know what content to commission and shoot, do you think? Or is that sci-fi? I don't think it's sci-fi because, I mean, it depends. I mean, in the sense of, I mean, if it is targeted, let's say, to sports, um, uh, then you can today um, do quite uh, quite well uh, summary clips of highlights uh, that are targeted to different um, people. Like um, the guys who is a Chelsea fan would get more uh, um, <laughs> uh, highlights for Chelsea than the other one. So that was one of them. Um, then obviously, does that mean that AI becomes itself um, uh, creative? I wouldn't say so. I think we are just much, much better in expressing rules together with AI um, to produce content that is creative enough um, for people to watch without being bored. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, testing and targeting is certainly alive and well in the form of Netflix and Amazon. Let's be under no illusions. Amazon know exactly what you're going to buy and what you do. Uh, be used on, as the basis to order new programs. But I think in terms of AI being creative and self-aware, if you like, we're seeing that. An external website, this person does not exist.com, and it's randomly generated faces based on you know average appearances over an enormous data set. And again, obviously, you know, the algorithm is only as intelligent as the data you feed it, but the bigger the data set you do feed it, that that that's the purity almost of machine learning. It goes to directions that you necessarily anticipate by finding those patterns that, that without any preconceptions. So just picking up on that theme about your tools of, of content, um, obviously the more images and the more video you get to work with, in theory, the more refined your tools become. But does that mean then that if I'm giving you my video to analyze, I'm also kind of helping my competitors by making your tools smarter? How do you kind of who owns the machine learning yeah. that comes from my video in your platform? Cool. It's a it's a really good question. So one of the things that's awesome about video and what, what we specialize at VidRover is multimodal machine learning. And so that means how do you use the text, audio, on screen, any existing metadata around the video as well as the visual content to kind of fuse those things together to maybe learn new people directly from a video library that's being sent to you. So. Um, one, I think we can actually learn from video. Video is a unique medium where actually being able to do that across those modalities is important. The second is a business question that I think we're seeing a lot more of now. So when we rolled out in 2016, we started signing customers, and that was not a question that anyone asked. They just like said, hey, I hope this gets better as I continue to use it. It gets better as people continue to use it. Everyone's happy. Um, now we are certainly starting to get into the, the question of, can we siphon off particular sections of data? And uh, I think the answer is certainly yes. That's something that we can easily build into our platforms. It's also something that broadly makes the solution better in many ways. Um, 
there is a lot of model drift if you open up something to all different types of content across customers and being somewhat specific from both an account perspective and a type of content perspective does provide real value. Mm. Any other thoughts on that? Well, I, th I think in a sense that we're, we're probably um, quite cautious in the way we're deploying AI within Sensei. Obviously, there's a, there's a big difference between what goes on in the R&D labs and the, the patterns that we're seeing amongst emerging data and what we choose to actually release as active, active features and functions in our products. They're very much tailored to an identified business need that, that, you know, needs, that needs addressing, and you're seeing that in the form of what we're actually shipping. Now you've kind of developed your own proprietary AI tools, your own cognitive learning and algorithms and so on to explore this content and that gives you your USP. But the, the public cloud providers will all offer image recognition tools and in the case of some of them they will claim that they've been trained on billions of images and billions of hours of content that are available from consumer sources. And how do you compete with that sort of vast wealth of, of content uh, and, and compete with APIs that any technology vendor here can plug into their, their system? Jacob. That's a very interesting question here. So I think, I don't know whether I can speak for everybody here, but I, I think the idea is really to have um, an editor, a tool that uh, um, helps you to do the work. Um, whether there is our AI behind it, or actually we do uh, integrate also with the AI of uh, the people of Amazon, Google, and IBM. Um, so as example, we do not have our own speech to text, but we integrate with the speech to text that is available from uh, um, uh, those uh, providers. Yeah, we, we, we sit here, over your shoulder is, is the uh, uh, one of the sponsors, of course, who's doing yeah. speech to text. Yeah. Everything we're saying, so we'll see how well that works. Um, and, uh, obviously, yeah. And any other thoughts on how you compete with, with the public cloud pro providers, Joe? Is that something you've heard yeah, about? Yeah, so I, th I think video is a really interesting medium for this competition to be happening. One, because uh, I always tell this, this, this story, whereas, like, say, a Google or an Amazon are training on billions of billions of very broad, typically generic and consumer type data. Um, when you go into specific verticals, media, post-production being one of them, the solutions might end up being very different from what is needed from a very generic solution. I'm a big baseball fan. Maybe not that many people are baseball fans here because we're in the UK. Uh, so maybe searching baseball over your video library would be sufficient to bring up the two or three videos that you have. I have thousands of videos from when I was watching the San Diego Padres. They're terrible. No one should watch them. So if you're going to get baseball after this, don't be a Padres fan. Uh, but I would search for behind home plate, Adrian Gonzalez, line drive left field, and a totally different way to search through that content. My buddy, who's the assistant director of scouting for the Padres, also has a video data set, and he looks for it for fastball, curveball, pitches over 97 miles per hour and does searches in an incredibly different way. So you have a similar data set across three different people, um, but the search queries and the way that those are used are completely different and could not kind of give the results um, that any one of those other three were looking if they did the other search queries. So in that way, building your own algorithms and being able to understand the use cases in specific verticals is really important. And that's one of the areas where I think video is a, a great medium for, for startups and, and other companies to be building solutions in. Uh, and with Sensei, is there a, a sort of one size fits all, or or is the is the model trained differently depending on whether I'm cutting some news footage or a feature film? Um, oh no, absolutely, it's very it's very case specific. So Sensei Sensei is a catch all brand for for all of the technology we use, including the targeting that we offer inside the digital marketing digital experience platform as well. Uh, so you know that lo looks at historical usage patterns from the user itself as well as the actual dynamic content in there in there as well. And I think Joe's right before in terms of sharing data, you know, we acknowledge, for example, on stock, on our stock repository, there may be a, a large percentage of overlap with our competition in terms of the actual physical assets that are, are available there, but it's the insights that we bring to that and the, and the connected experience of asset retrieval and content velocity, once again, getting that into your output that uh, we find to be the more compelling way of competing. Uh, how much creative control do we have over these uh, AI-enabled tools? Is it the case that we kind of switch on this black box, put video in one end, and, and clips or highlights or results or, or nice edits come out the other? Or is this actually something that we need to manage as another piece of our toolkit and control and learn how to use and learn how to get the best of? 
Jack, you, you could perhaps pick up on that. Yeah, so uh, I think the notion of black box, I've, uh, I use that actually sometimes to describe what um, some of my competitors are doing um, because you don't know what's actually happening. So you put something in, you get something out, but you have no idea why. Um, so we did a completely different approach where you basically have a set of rules that you can um, fine tune in order to say, oh, I actually want, let me come back here to this great example of sports. Um, if there's a goal, then I want to have the first 30 seconds um, until the goal and the f next 15 seconds, but I do not want to cut into the audio and I do not want to cut into the replay. Um, so uh, there is obviously some AI behind it to know where those cuts are, but nevertheless, you have given the role, uh, uh, this, uh, this rule, and you can see then how it has been applied. I would say false positives are that we, well, cut a bit wrongly, but it's not like uh, we produce a, a completely different clip as no goal at all in it. Yeah. And if an editor is using Sensei and say Premiere Pro, do you? Do you give a level of control so that one, one editor's idea of shot matching is maybe different from another's? Very much so. So certainly for the time being, um, fully automated content creation is not, is not the goal. You know, Sensei is a digital assistant. So for in the examples you saw earlier um, with, the, with the cropping and masking, you're, you're given a set of vectors and automatable data that, that is a starting point that you know, may have saved the lion's share of the time taken to get in and do micro, micro pixel drawing masks. And that then is very much a starting point for the editor to begin to use their creativity, having removed some of the prep work, if you like. So very much so. So the theme of this session is, is where it's worked in film and TV. And I, we've talked there a little bit about the workflow and the technology and what it can do in terms of detecting images and, and clipping and, and helping the post-production process. I'd like to just explore some of the business models and, and why people might invest in AI tools. Because there's always a risk that there's some cool new technology that's out there in search of a solution. And yeah, maybe it can help, but does it help me make more money? So is it about incrementally making the process a little bit more efficient? Is it about unlocking completely new ways of working or monetizing content? Well, you know, where's the payback if I go down this AI route? Cool. So uh, I'll just make two kind of quick comments around this. And I think one is certainly operational efficiencies. Everyone is looking to be able to publish more content that's more specialized um, to more eyeballs. And being able to do that more efficiently on the back end is always something that's going to be valuable. The other thing that I think is really potentially interesting in this space is being able to take pieces of content that were undiscoverable or unfindable five or six years ago and building a way that those are then monetizable. One of the really cool um, versions of this that we've seen that ended up launching last year uh, was the Warren Buffett archive. Um, and so it's just 300 hours of a bunch of Warren Buffett content uh, that CNBC ended up putting on their website. So it's just stuff that they had that, you know, they probably weren't monetizing at any point in time. And now there's people actively going back and finding all this different Buffett content and looking through it, um, which I think is a really compelling possible use case moving forward for monetization. Uh, just to follow up on that briefly, a lot of AI tools work in the cloud, which mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense, but a lot of archive content is not in the cloud. Yeah. So how do you get around that problem? Yeah, it's a <laughs> that is a very hard problem. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you can't get around it. Um, you could either try to go on prem. That is hard um, and difficult, or you have to move it into the cloud somehow. It's that is. I would say that is an unsolved problem at okay. this point in time. I guess that can eat into the ROI. If yeah. You have to spend a bunch on moving your archive up into the cloud first yep. to see what you exactly. Got. Yep. 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 Jagger, where, where are you seeing the value coming from? Yeah, both in uh, getting to business models that were not possible before. I mean, uh, um, as I said, uh, this um, app that Bean has implemented in order that you can just see the highlights in a, in a timeline and you can do that for all the games that are currently on. In order to do that, you would probably, without a platform such as Waldmarker, um, you would probably need to hire for each game at least one editor. Um, uh, maybe even more, um, because you need an editor and then you need somebody who writes a good text, because it's not just giving the, the video, but to have the text that a real journalist may uh, better formulate than an editor and definitely better than a machine. So uh, that is, is, is this 
text is very important. So that is why even on a full automated system, typically you do have journalists behind it in order to type in the human touch. Because without the human touch, the interactions on social media platforms are not the same. And that is basically where you get your value, the, um, uh, the payback. is how many people interact, how many people maybe have seen the advertisement or the sponsor logo, which was in behind. And obviously all of that you can also count together with AI because you can identify that logo. Where are you seeing the biggest payback in, in maybe in post-production? I would definitely concur with the examples already given in terms of generation of greater content volume and surfacing of content that may be inaccessible due to, due to the sheer volume of it. But also for us as well, um, widening the net um, on the accessible, addressable market of creatives. So by having tools like Rush now available on a phone that has within it automatic audio cleanup, level balancing, color matching, shot stabilization, the things like that. Um, obviously, you, you're, you're kind of widening the reach of people who might decide to dig into the creative tools and, and start publishing their own stuff. It can be a bit bewildering to know where to start with AI. There's a whole raft of new vendors, really innovative vendors like, like Wildmarker, like Video Rover, coming onto the market with really exciting new technology. Um, at the same time, a lot of existing vendors um, are adding AI capabilities into their products. It, it pretty much seems that everybody's talking about AI. Um, is some of that overblown? And how do you cut through all of the complexity of the market and decide where to start? Where, where do you start? Where do you focus first? I, I think, like you say, it, you need to find a solution to an established problem and, and not the other way around. You know, um, for the, the Roto Brush yes. tool, as an example, um, it is always something that has required hours and hours of painstaking labor, and that you know is an occupation, mask painting and moving forward frame by frame. But um, really, you're just kind of expanding the areas in which something that like that might be used you know people might give that up as a as a bad job before and go and reshoot it just because something is too yeah. complex but now if you can have more and more sensitive algorithms that understand the nature of an edge and a background and foreground and object you know content aware fill as well as roto following and all of that kind of stuff can can perhaps change the way we look at the, the content we've shot and, and approaches to you know the way of the way of actually manipulating that type of footage mm. yeah i yeah I, I agree with that i think I can't say how to find AI technologies because I am an AI technology. I want you to find me. Um, but one thing that I, I would say that we do a lot now of is qualifying whether or not there is a actual need within the workflow that the company is looking for. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, I, I want to use machine learning in my workflow, I probably can't work with you. If you come and say, hey, I have these 100 hours of videos that are under monetized because are they're not being surfaced across this, this, and this application, I can probably figure out a solution that's going to be helpful for you in that space. So being able to understand what is the core business use case, what is the ROI on it, and how can I get, um, and then how can I find a technical solution that really answers that is so important in building things um, that work. And I think one thing that we've seen over the past few years is people say, oh, I want to put machine learning in my workflow, spend some money, try to do it, nothing happens, and then across the organization, it's much more difficult to get that built in. So come at it with a problem first. Is there a danger that uh, people think there's gold in them, their archives, and actually when you apply the technology to it, they discover that it's actually <laughs> not very useful after all? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely on a company by company basis. You have to understand the demand for the content in there, um, and sometimes it's not there, so you have to be realistic with yourself as to what's happening. Yeah. Any tips on where to start from your perspective? Yeah, so I we definitely do not see us uh, competing with AI um, or uh, vendors on a general level or uh, on um, um, or with Adobe. I would rather say we complement them. Um, uh, we are really focused on uh, making things work for uh, people like journalists instead of uh, a fully trained editor on Adobe or on. Uh, um, Avid or other people as um, uh, big tools in the broadcast world and then to bring that to the digital media. 
So it is a different focus, and then maybe bring it back um, um, uh, to um, yeah to the guys um, in the broadcast uh, world um, um, via edit decision list. Good. Now we have some time for your questions. Um, so firstly, if you've got a question that you'd like to put to any of our panelists about how best to use AI, but actually if you've got any experiences to share of where it's worked or not worked in your organization, that would also be interesting to hear. So if anyone wants to be brave and put their hand up, um, just quickly tell us who you are and what organization you're from and then your, uh, your question. Hi, I'm Neeti from Cognizant. And uh, you spoke about, okay, I'll raise my voice. Um, you spoke about monetizing archives. So, um, and we know that, um, you know, deep search is as good as the meta tagging along with it. So how future ready is the meta tagging today? And uh, do you think in the future people will look back to the archives that we're creating right now and say, oh yeah, we can't, we can't use them, we can't monetize them now anymore? And uh, I had a second uh, follow-on question. Um, well, let, let's take that one first before we get lost. So, cool. yeah. Joe, maybe a question for you as it's sort of focused on archive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. two, two questions. Uh, I guess two responses. One, I think we still have a long way to go, right? Understanding the way that people will be searching through that, that video library will depend broadly what type of information we're going to be wanting to apply across that video. So like I said, if you're going to have a very specific enterprise style use case where you have very smart, educated um, like customers in a particular field searching over the video, then you're going to need to have tags that work like that. The other thing that I would articulate that's important is, it is there is a gap moving from simple API data solution to intelligent search solution that has nice features, good functionality, and returns the right results. Um, and so you do need a solution that's end to end. Either you have to have the technical expertise internally, or you have to have uh, a company that's going to help you build that entire end to end solution. Good. Any other questions? One, one over here. Thank you. Again, just let us know who you are, where you're from, and, and what the question is. Hi, uh, Neil Anderson. Um, AI technology consultant. Um, we haven't talked about one area that I've seen around AI, which is around compliance challenges. I don't know if you guys have had any requests about trying to help solve any of those types of challenges. Yeah, something okay. we talked about at the start, okay. actually. So, okay, Can you repeat the question? Uh, about compliance. Ah, so compliance um, detecting profanity, sexual scenes, commercial content, and so on. Okay. I, I so, I'm, I'm, so, 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 Speaking for Walt Marker, um, that's not our target because it's not what our customers are asking us for. However, what we do detect and uh, what people do want to know is like whether there was a sponsor in it because they want to monetize on it. Um, but profanity, it's not my part of uh, the business. Not for you guys. Yeah. Have you had that challenge in archive content where there's a risk that there yeah. may be something that can't go out? Yeah, it's a great question. So from our side, it's not necessarily our specialty, although we do provide some solutions that could, that could help that. Um, anything that we end up putting in front of an editor, we kind of just pass the buck and say, you're going to see it. You better not put something out there that's bad type thing. Uh, and Neil, do you think there's a concern that in that area of compliance in particular, it has to be 100% right? Because if it throws up too many false positives, you may as well do it manually. And if just one thing slips through the net, it's a disaster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's nev you're never going to replace humans in the compliance chain, but it would certainly help inform the compliance process. Right. Yep. You know, if you're doing speech to text recognition or identifying certain visual content, you know, anything that helps is, is going to be a, a potentially a big time saver. But yeah, it's 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 very it's very challenging, and it has real financial and legal consequences if you get it wrong. So you know, that's where I could help but cool. not replace people. Yeah, so cool. an, as an assistant rather than a replacement. Um, time for one more question, I think, if anyone has one. Um, if not, let me ask each of you to round off with a sort of final thought on if, if someone is thinking about embarking or, or, or thinks that their workflow would benefit from AI, um, where do you think the quick wins are to be had? Where would you recommend people look first and, and maybe get a, get a quick result? And it may depend on your area of focus, of course, of yeah. archive and automating the editorial process and clipping and, and editing. But you know, where, where, where would you suggest people begin their, their, uh, their projects? 
cool. I think repurposing content is a really great way to start and a really uh, interesting and useful place. So oftentimes you can take post-production content and stuff that you know looks great and then trying to monetize it in different avenues. Um, clearly define the problem and then clearly define what you think the ROI will be and go find that solution that'll help you do it. I would always say, yeah, I mean, automation, um, yeah. um, whatever can be repeatedly done uh, via AI, um, that can be a great uh, quick win. But on the other hand, don't go shopping for AI, go shopping for the tool. Yeah. You want to yeah. a solution for a problem and not an AI algorithm. Yeah, yeah. absolutely con concur with that. Um, monetizing content as well, Measure measuring and monetizing as well as repurposing. I think all of those areas are important. Perfect, thank you. Um, if you're interested in other cutting edge tech, then do stay with us because in 15 minutes time, we will be looking at uh, blockchain and how that can be used for um, <laughs> digital content rights management. So that's another interesting emerging area. But for now, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking our panel. Uh, Joe Ellis from uh, Vidrover, nearly dropped my notes. Uh, Jacob Hummus from um, uh, Wild Mocha and uh, Neil Stevens from Adobe. Thank you for uh, sharing thank your you. thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you.